Well, uh, ganglia are cysts that occur in different parts of the body. So the most common would be the one that people get on the wrist. That's an extraneural ganglion in that it's a collection of fluid, mucinous type of thick fluid, that has pooched out of a joint. Uh, the same type of cyst has been found in within nerves, within the substance of nerves, for uh, over 200 years now. And the, the real question is, is how they've occurred and why they've occurred and how to treat them. So for uh, 10 years, I've been interested in how they form. Most of that's been dealing with my own patients and then reviewing the literature. And I think, like anything else, you get passionate about a subject. And I tell my wife that the passion has turned into more of an obsession. <laughs> um, but I've accumulated the whole world's literature. In fact, we're going through 40 Japanese articles now and having them translated word for word because they're not even indexed on PubMed. But as a result, by reviewing the entire world's literature, we've been able to sort of analyze all the cases, not just the 30 that I've seen or so, but cases of colleagues, cases around the world. And as such, we've recognized that there are very stereotypical type of patterns of these cysts. And to me, all of a sudden, it became pretty clear that if this was just being formed de novo, in other words, if they just formed, these types of cysts wouldn't form in the same location, have similar shapes, have similar clinical presentations, have identical MRI features. There has to be a common denominator. And then based on my training, both as an orthopedist and a neurosurgeon, it made a lot of sense that these have to come from a joint. And there are nerve branches that are very small that come from or they innervate, they feed the joint, and they provide some sort of uh, sensation, biofeedback type of sensation to the joint. But that these, which have been known, these types of small uh, branches, have been thought to be instrumental in preventing pain, mm -hmm. may be playing a role in the development of this type of cyst. So that was my working theory for 10 years based on my analysis of cases. But what got me really intrigued was, again, this sort of obsession where I wanted to find the first case. Mm -hmm. And everyone had attributed it to uh, 1810 Duchenne reference. And as a neurosurgeon, Duchenne was a very famous French neurologist. Mm -hmm. Uh, so anyone who's studied neuroscience is familiar with things like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, for example, which is a common form of muscular dystrophy. But in any event, he was a internationally world leader in neurology. So I think the assumption was is that 1810 Duchenne was the man. So when I started digging around, I, I noticed that um, that wouldn't quite fit. Uh, for all of the literature because, in fact, Duchenne was only four years old at that time. So I found that one a little bit difficult to fathom. So in any event, I've been uh, trying to play sleuth to try to find this. And we started digging around and I found, found a very helpful person in France who had an internet service for history of medicine. And he was able to lead me to a clue which led me to another clue. And before you knew it, I found that it wasn't Duchenne, it was Beauchenne. And you can understand the not only the error and typographic errors, but obviously the import because people were associating it probably with Duchenne, which had a recognition. Okay. But in any event, uh, so then we found the original source and citation, and it, there was a thesis, and then we were able to corroborate uh, Beauchenne, and then we were able to corroborate that he actually had a very famous father, who in fact was one of the physicians for Louis XVIII and the French Revolution. So then it got very interesting, this historical search. But what was really fortunate was not only could we find the citation, but there was some reference that this, the actual specimen was still floating around in a museum at one point, that they had resected it, so they took the cyst out with the nerve. And this is what's really important now, is, is that the treatment at times has been very radical, if you will. This is a benign process, and people are resecting normal nerve. And in fact, if the joint is the problem, then you can do a pretty relatively easy operation just attacking that little joint connection. And you don't even have to deal with the nerve or the cyst and still get a very good outcome. So I thought there was importance enough to find the cyst. So in any event, we did some more digging. And it turns out that this specimen 
was still available. And despite the wars and financial problems with the museum, it was on a museum shelf. So my, my wife and I, uh, my wife's a physician here and she's a French speaking person, so we went over to Paris and I had to struggle with her to get her to Paris to come with me, but I enticed her uh, for a weekend in Paris to go see a specimen <laughs> in a museum. And we played detective over there and found the specimen and analyzed it. And we were trying to figure out, well, how could we prove that the specimen actually proved the connection? And the answer we came to on the plane was if there was a, a lumen, so if the branch to the joint was in fact the conduit, so if you have a connection to a joint, mm -hmm. then nerves normally don't have hollow spaces where the cyst is. Mm -hmm. So we were predicting that the nerve specimen would have to have the balloon-like cyst, but within the nerve. But then there would be a branch off of it that had a hollow lumen. So we found this specimen, which was uh, now able to be studied. We couldn't take it out of the bottles, nor did we want to, because we wanted to preserve it for other people. And when we rolled it over and turned it around, we could see, in fact, that the, this was remarkably well preserved. And there was a cystic expansion of the nerve, just like all the ones that we've seen and studied. But indeed, there was a hollow lumen. Eureka. I mean, that's the only way that this theoretically could occur. From a practical point of view, I, I think the theory really holds that this is a joint-related problem. And people who were getting unnecessary types of radical approaches, that can be eliminated now. Because I think, from a practical point of view, this shows us, I think, as clear as day, that the problem has to be at the joint and that if you fix the joint problem, the cyst will go away. Sure. Now, these are rare, so there are only about 400 cases in the literature mm -hmm. of these. But I think it's, it's been a curiosity, it's been a mystery. And I think it's always nice when 200 years later, using the tools that you have, MRI, internet, etc., can solve a problem. So if we can learn about this one rare thing and study it in a vacuum, we can then apply it to the more common problem. So the, the treatment that we've been applying is finding that joint connection and just disconnecting it. I, I think it's uh, taking some classical training that you have of histor history and um, finding original sources and then spending the time and studying them. And I think in this case we were able to come full circle where not only could we find the citation which was satisfying, but in the end, studying the specimen really allowed us to make important conclusions.